This video is brought to you by Policy Genius. If you've got family members who depend on your income, you need life insurance. That's where Policy Genius comes in. More about them in a bit. Imagine this. With the Second World War looking increasingly unwinnable, in early 1944, a six-engine Junkers Ju-390 America bomber lumbered skyward from a Luftwaffe airstrip near Bordeaux in France. Droning unescorted over the Atlantic for more than 3,600 miles, that's about 5,800 kilometers, on a grueling 16-plus hour voyage, the weary crew of the German wonder weapon finally spied the New York skyline less than 10 miles in the distance. Ironically, however, final preparations didn't include crewmen lining up their complex sites and opening their aircraft's immense bomb bay doors before dropping a high-explosive payload on the Big Apple. Instead, they apparently congratulated one another, snapped a few quick photos to mark the occasion, then swung their immense bird around 180 degrees and just headed for home. As scary as this scenario is, well, there are a few glaring problems. Neither the photos nor any official records have ever been found. In fact, fly logs seized after Germany's surrender showed that the only 390 that ever flew was undergoing preliminary testing in Czechoslovakia at the time of that purported mission to New York. The truth is that it was probably little more than just a fairy tale concocted by Nazi PR men. One is one based entirely on testimony gleaned from post-war interrogations of Luftwaffe pilots and navigators who claimed to have been on board. For their part, the Allies found it difficult to fathom that the Nazis would send an expensive, untested, and relatively defenseless prototype on such a dangerous mission to within miles of America's heavily defended East Coast, apparently simply because they could. The America Bomber Project was an initiative of the German Ministry of Aviation that was purportedly on the drawing board years before World War II actually began. Along with upper echelon Luftwaffe brass, ministry officials were keen to get their hands on a strategic bomber capable of crossing the Atlantic, striking New York City, and then returning home safely. With a round trip distance of around 7,200 miles, that's 11,600 kilometers, it was a particularly ambitious scheme considering the technology of the day. But original specs mandated that the machines have the stamina to reach America from bases in the Azores, not continental Europe. This would have cut nearly 900 miles, that's 1,450 kilometers off the trip, but when Portugal's dictator Antonio Salazar, who'd had a historically cozy relationship with the Nazis, leased a base in the Azores to the Allies, this became an impossibility. Regardless of where they could and couldn't fly from, many designers and Luftwaffe officers considered the plan just sheer folly, arguing that even if a plane could be built with enough range to make the round trip, it would need to be packed almost entirely with fuel and the resulting bomb load would just be laughably small. Even before 1940, Messerschmitt designers had been tinkering with large multi-engine bomber designs behind the scenes, despite being ordered to focus exclusively on more conventional aircraft, which were seen as a much greater priority. Nonetheless, the plan was submitted to Reichsmarschall Hermann Goering at the end of April 1942, after which he discussed the matter with other Luftwaffe bigwigs, and indeed, with Adolf Hitler himself. By that time, Germany had what looked like a world-beating air force, one that was more than capable of doing its part in the conquest of Europe. Though the Luftwaffe had everything from iconic single-engine fighters like ME-109s and FW-190s to twin-engine destroyers, the world's first operational jet fighter bomber, and dozens of ground attack, reconnaissance, and medium bomber aircraft already in production, unlike America and Britain, they never had an effective, mass-produced, four-engine, long-range bomber. Fokker Wolf's FW-200C Condor did arguably fit the bill, but it was little more than a hastily converted airliner, of which less than 300 were built, and their overall contribution to the war effort was really rather minimal. 
Now, Nazi high command knew that at least in the early going, most of the aerial combat in which their pilots would be engaged would take place within the relatively small confines of Europe, the Mediterranean, and North Africa. In these instances, medium-range bombers were usually adequate, but with the increasing likelihood of America entering the war, it became evident that larger and more capable machines were going to be needed. Perhaps even ones large enough to deliver heavy, conventional, and possibly even nuclear payloads to cities like New York, Philadelphia, and Washington, D.C., as well as factories that were vital to America's war effort. Some of America's largest defense contractors, companies like the Aluminum Corporation of America, American Car and Foundry, Chrysler, Colt, Pratt & Whitney, and Curtis Wright, had factories spread along the Atlantic coast and the Midwest, from Connecticut to Michigan, Pennsylvania to Indiana, and, well, just about everywhere else in between. As the global conflict raged, B-17 fly fortresses and B-24 liberators were already hammering Axis targets around the globe. Boeing's massive B-29s that would ultimately deliver atomic payloads on Hiroshima and Nagasaki were close to being ready for production, while on the other hand, Germany's America bomber hadn't even got out of the concept phase. So that said, the American plan to bomb America was never about pounding the country into submission. Even if the planes had been built in large numbers, everyone knew that their effectiveness was going to be limited and that after the first mission, the skies over the American coastline would just be swarming with fighters and interceptors that would have a field day with these lumbering behemoths. Much like the V-1 and the V-2 rockets, even when successful, the bombers would have inflicted little damage to American city and industry. However, they would have terrorized civilians and caused the military to use valuable resources to defend against subsequent attacks. And if they did actually destabilize the country's war industries even just a little bit, well, that was all the better for the Nazis. Now, in this respect, the scheme was also similar to the Doolittle raid on Tokyo. Though Jimmy Doolittle's B-25 Mitchells did scant damage, their attack terrified Japanese citizens, and as a result, the military was forced to divert anti-aircraft batteries and fighters from other theaters where they were vitally needed. Now we'll get back to today's video in just a moment. First, here's a quick word from today's sponsor, Policy Genius. Look, nobody likes to think about life insurance, but the reality is that it's an important layer of protection for many families, especially for single income households. Fortunately, there's Policy Genius and their award winning policy options ranked number one by Forbes. Whether you've been putting off your purchase or you just never really thought about it, Policy Genius is the team that you want to check in with. This is a third party marketplace that works for you, not for the insurance companies. So you can be sure that their licensed experts are giving you solid, unbiased advice. Now, life insurance premiums might seem like a financial drain, but you could save $1,300 or more per year by using Policy Genius to compare life insurance policies. If you're interested, head to policygenius.com to get started. In just a few minutes, you can work out how much coverage you need and compare personalized quotes to find your best price. When you're ready to apply, the Policy Genius team will handle the paperwork and the scheduling for free. You could save 50% or more on life insurance by comparing quotes with Policy Genius and getting covered now locks in your rate. Over the course of a 10 or 20 year policy, those savings really add up. And best of all, eligible applicants can get covered in as little as a week. Head to policygenius.com to get started. You'll be glad you did, because when it comes to insurance, it's nice to get it right. And now, back to today's video. Wolf, Heinkel, Horton, Junkers, and Messerschmitt submitted proposals for the American bomber project. But of all the initial concepts put forward, most were just ultimately abandoned because they were too expensive, incorporated untested systems and power plants, and would require gobs of time, money, and resources to develop, all of which were just in painfully short supply. Though most of the specifics were left up to the discretion of aircraft engineers, the planes would need to fly high enough to put them out of range of US fighters and interceptors, hence it was envisioned that defensive armament just wouldn't be needed. The most promising proposals were based on relatively conventional designs that would have resembled the Allied bombers of the day, though many were significantly larger and heavier. Horton's flying wing design was among the most revolutionary proposals submitted. Powered by six turbojets, the futuristic, tailless bomber might have had the range and payload necessary to carry out missions in America, but development costs would have been absolutely astronomical, and it would have been years before production models were ready to fly. 
Not surprisingly, only three prototypes were built before that project was cancelled. With its HE-177 Dornier DO-217 setup, Heinkel submitted another radical proposal. The larger HE-177 bomber would carry a crude Dornier DO-217 on its back out into the middle of the Atlantic Ocean where the two planes would detach. Then the Dornier would continue on alone on the last leg of the mission over to America. However, 217s were never intended to make the return trip to Europe. Instead, after dropping their payloads, crews would ditch their planes at sea and, if all went according to plan, be rescued by U-boats before they drowned or were devoured by sharks or died of hypothermia. Sounds like a mission that absolutely nobody would volunteer for. Though it was the center of much discussion between Luftwaffe and Kriegsmarine officers, this setup was never tested. In a classic case of interbranch squabbling and rivalry, the Kriegsmarine refused to have one of its submarines act as a rescue ship, and that project was also nixed. Famed Austrian aerospace engineer Eugen Sanger may have secretly scoffed at his competitors' designs because what he envisioned was a suborbital rocket bomber unlike anything the world had ever seen. Before the war, he had been tinkering with this groundbreaking concept, which was akin to a manned V-2 rocket with wings and a fuselage. Preliminary tests were carried out in 1944, but again, this technology was just in its infancy and, as you know, time was of the essence. Sanger's design had been developed. It was estimated that the lifting body would launch itself into orbit, skip through the upper reaches of the nearly airless atmosphere at an astonishing speed of 14,000 miles per hour, that's 22,500 kilometers an hour, after which it would drop an 8,000 pound or 3,600 kilogram bomb on New York. Junker's JU-390 proposal was submitted in May of 1942, and unlike most of the company's other designs, it was actually selected for production, though in the end, only two prototypes were built. Based on Junker's JU-290, 390s would be crewed by 10 airmen and have theoretical bomb loads exceeding 20,000 pounds, or about 9,100 kilograms. In addition, they'd be bristling with defensive armaments, including three cannons and four machine guns that would have given the slow birds at least some degree of defense against the American aircraft that would have intercepted them. With wingspans of 165 feet, 50 meters, and powered by six 1,800 horsepower BMW radial engines, 390s would technically be capable of making the round trip between Europe and America, thanks largely to their low cruise speeds and fuel capacity of slightly more than 9,000 US gallons, that's 7,500 imperial gallons. On the downside, this would never have been possible with a full payload, much of which would have been needed to be dedicated to additional fuel. Like many of the proposed American bombers, the 390s designers were trapped in a particularly vicious circle. First, more engines and greater fuel loads were needed for long-range flight. These, of course, added weight and drag, both of which limited range and payload, thereby making most of the aircraft wholly unsuited for the jobs for which they'd been designed. Designed by Kurt Tank of FW-190 fame and incorporating elements from a number of existing aircraft, Fokker Wolf's TA-400 featured shoulder-mounted wings and six BMW 801 radial engines, to which Tank proposed adding jet engines to increase range, speed, and payload. Like Boeing's B-29 Superfortress, TA-400s would feature tricycle landing gears, pressurized cabins, bubble cockpits at the front of their fuselages, and a number of remotely operated cannon and machine gun turrets. Fuel would have been distributed to engines from nearly three dozen individual tanks strategically placed around the aircraft for optimal weight distribution. And 53,000 pounds, that's 24,000 kilograms. The proposed bomb load was in a class of itself. Cruising at just over 200 miles per hour, 325 kilometers an hour, TA-400s driven by piston and jet engines may have had ranges exceeding 8,000 miles or about 13,000 kilometers. But though Focke-Wulf was considered a legitimate contender for the American bomber competition, its TA-400 was never anything more than an unfinished prototype.
Messerschmitt's ME264 was another conventional, if relatively promising design of which only three aircraft were built. Based on the company's long-range maritime reconnaissance aircraft, 264s were all-metal, four-engine, high-wing airplanes powered by BMW radials producing 1,700 horsepower and later Daimler-Benz inverted V12s rated at 1,900 horsepower each. With maximum takeoff weights of approximately 123,000 pounds, that's 56,000 kilograms, and top speeds at approximately 340 miles per hour, 264s were among the fastest of the America bombers that ever flew, though cruise speed was more than 100 miles per hour slower. Features included a number of remotely operated turrets, as well as crew beds and a small galley for preparing in-flight snacks. Defensive armaments and creature comforts aside, with a service ceiling of just 26,250 feet, that's 8,000 meters, they weren't capable of flying out of reach of American fighters and interceptors, and though their ranges exceeded 9,000 miles, that's about 14 1,500 kilometers, bomb loads on long distance missions would have been less than 6,000 pounds or about 2,700 kilograms. As such, the Luftwaffe favored other American bomber designs, namely the JE 390, TA 400, and the Heikel HE 277. Of the three units built, two were destroyed during Allied bombing raids before they'd ever even taken to the air. In addition to the aforementioned 390 flight to America, there were other uncorroborated and uh, probably fictitious accounts of long-range American bomber missions. The second JU 390 prototype was said to have flown non-stop from Germany to South Africa in 1944, but again, there's little evidence that it did, aside from a hazy story told by the test pilot. It was also claimed that the Seoul ME-264 made multiple flights between Berlin and Tokyo, though these stories probably sprouted from the rumor that the plane was kept in reserve to transport Hitler and his cronies to Japan if the plot to assassinate him, led by Klaus von Stauffenberg, couldn't be thwarted. Stories also arose about the ME-264 being retrofitted with a 5,500-horsepower steam turbine engine that would turn a single propeller nearly 18 feet in diameter, that's 5.5 meters. In the end, however, the story's fanciful nature pegs it for what it was. Just a bit of a tall tale. In the days before aerial refueling, when engines were relatively anemic and consumed tons of fuel, bombers capable of flying nearly 10,000 miles with massive payloads were more just a dream than a reality. Had adequate resources been earmarked for the project, German designers could have conceivably pulled it off. But as more than a few noted historians pointed out, Germany lacked a clear central authority to oversee concepts like the American bomber. In addition, piston engines of the day were lucky to crank out 2,000 horsepower, but though more powerful power plants were available, most were just a bit unreliable. To the consternation of his subordinates, throughout the war, Hitler was inclined to waste vast resources on projects that had little chance of success. Likewise, in the mid-year wars, Allied bombing severely disrupted German manufacturing and supply chains, which meant that everything from steel and aluminium to gasoline and ammunition became increasingly scarce. As the war drew to a close and enemies closed in from, well, just about every side, Nazi Germany was forced to recall great quantities of men and material for the defense of the fatherland. Perhaps if Germany had been farther along in its development of nuclear weapons, the program may have taken on a new urgency, but the truth was that the cost for delivering small conventional bomb loads on New York City just wasn't justified. Ultimately, each proposed American bomber was abandoned, but after the war, their advanced design elements became of great interest to aerospace engineers in Europe and America. In fact, Eugene Sanger's lifting body would be the foundation on which America's space shuttle program was eventually built. So I really hope you found today's video interesting. If you did, smash that like button below. Don't forget to subscribe. If you've got a suggestion for a future Mega Projects video, utilize the comment section below and let me know what you want to see. And I'll see you next time.